Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to my guide to the royal city of Rabinaster, the newest 24-man raid in Final Fantasy XIV. To unlock this raid, you must follow the quest chain that starts with Dramatis Personae in Kugane until it becomes available. You must have a minimum item level of 305 to enter. You may win one item level 330 piece of armor per week until probably 4.2, and you also get a Rabinaster coin once per week, which can be exchanged for items to upgrade creation, tombstone, armor, and accessories. The last boss also has a bunch of additional rewards. This instance is broken up into four bosses with some light trash in between. To skip to a specific boss, please use the timestamps in the description of the video. After a bit of running, you will immediately encounter the first boss without any trash. This boss is Mateus, who uses tons of ice-focused abilities. At the start of the fight, Mateus is accompanied by several ice isers, which just explode upon death, so get out of those AoEs. Mateus himself has a conal cleave, so the main tank should keep him facing away from the group and the other adds during the fight. Shortly into the fight, Mateus will cast Unbind, which will summon an untargetable ice ballerina in the middle of the arena. The arena will then be covered in an icy track that swirls around that the ballerina will follow from the center until she reaches the outer edge. Along this ice path are several sets of water-related objects. Each one of them transforms into something if the ballerina successfully skates through them. The small bubbles turn into ice slave adds, but they can be destroyed simply by walking into them. This does give you the drown debuff though, freezing you if you get hit by any ice skills, especially the ballerina skating over you. The Aqua Spheres will transform into giant ice balls if she skates through them, which can be lethal to the party when Unbind ends, so kill them before she reaches them. There are also several Water Pillars, which become targetable Blizzard 3s when she skates through those. We simply killed the Blizzard 3s when they spawned. Failure to kill them before they cast the White Whisper will turn all players tethered to it into snowmen, who run around and do large AoEs to other players. Once the Ballerina has completed her circuit, Mateus will rebind, removing the Ice Swirl. He will then use Dual Cast Blizzard 4, slamming several Ice Balls to the ground, each of them creating a Proximity AoE. There are safe spots players can run to that are far enough away from the other Proximity AoEs that you won't take a lot of damage, but there's less safe spots to stand if you didn't kill the Aquaspheres before they got frozen. Killing no Aquaspheres before getting Dual Cast Blizzard 4, you're gonna have a bad time. Next, Mateus will surround the arena in water, submerging all the players and gradually giving them stacks of Breathless. When you hit 10 stacks of Breathless, you drown, instantly dying. To counter this, kill the Flume Toads that Mateus is spawning to summon Air Pockets, which will reset your stacks when you run into them. Several Icicles will target players and dash towards them here. The damage they deal is not too bad, but they do pop any bubbles that they pass through along the way, so keep them away from the air pockets. Keep killing toads and keeping icicles away for the entire phase while making sure not to get to 10 stacks. Next, Mateus will place the Drowned debuff on everyone alive and tether several ice orbs to the Alliance. These orbs will chase players, occasionally firing a narrow conal ice AoE at them, freezing them if the AoE makes contact. Stay away from the orbs and dodge any of the AoEs your alliance fires in your direction by accident, I promise. Finally, Mateus will go to the center of the room, become untargetable, and summon three Azure Guards. Place down markers before the fight to assign an ad for each alliance to pick up. They need to remain separated by quite some distance or they take significantly reduced damage, so drag them slightly closer to the nearest wall to get them further away. The Azure Guards do cleave for quite a bit of damage, and Mateus will summon more Ice Azures that act the same as they did before, so AoE down those Azures and kill the Azure Guard to return Mateus to the arena. He will hit the entire raid pretty hard here, so heal up and mitigations before and after. Likely that this instant kills you if you take too long with those adds, but didn't have the opportunity to see that. At this point, he begins repeating his rotation from Unbind until he is dead, so just finish him off. Between Mateus and the second boss are some Seek adds and several dozens of Black Chocobos that come in waves. After defeating a large number of Black Chocobos, an untargetable Red Chocobo will appear and summon a Choco Meteor in the middle of the room, dealing proximity damage, and you'll want to get away from it. It hits pretty hard. Once the Red Chocobo flees, the treasure chests will all turn into Mimics, which you just have to kill before you head to the second boss. The second boss is Hashmal. His mechanics are simple, but mistakes here can be quite a bit more punishing than Mateus, so let's get started. Hashmal himself spends most of the first phase introducing you to his mechanics before amping it up in phase 2. He has a tank cleave called Rock Cutter that hits pretty hard, and he uses Quake 4 to do raid-wide damage quite frequently. 
He also sometimes summons fissures that spawn below players several times in succession, which you should try to run out of and kite away from your fellow teammates. Hashmal also summons control towers from time to time, before immediately slicing them in two. The tower will slowly begin to topple, and when it falls over completely, it'll kill anyone in the line AoE based on the direction it is falling. The AoE is deceptively large and a little wider than you might expect, so your best bet is to just stay to its side or behind it, or just get the hell away from it to stay safe. Hashmal also uses Earth Hammer, which summons a floating hammer above the arena. After a short delay, it will fall, dealing proximity damage to the raid. Run away from the origin point for these as soon as you see them in the sky, as the proximity warning on the ground is only present for about a second before it hits. Finally, Hashmal can jump off the arena and use Extreme Edge. This attack dive bombs through the center of the arena, dealing high damage to anyone it hits. When Hashmal is casting this ability, you can actually see him along the outside of the arena. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that one of Hashmal's hands is glowing red. This is an indicator that if you're on that side of Hashmal when dodging Extreme Edge, that you'll be inflicted with an incredibly potent Flesh Wounds damage over time, dealing like 15k damage every 3 seconds. You'll want to identify which side his Fiery Fist is on, and then make sure to not be on that side, by any means necessary. After about 30% of his health, Hashmal will go to the center and summon a giant Command Tower. You'll need to kill this Command Tower to bring Hashmal down, but three Sand Sphere adds will also spawn on three sides of the room. You'll need to kill them before they finish casting Two Dust. Once again, we assign alliances via markers before the fight starts, as you can see in the video. Hashmal still unleashes attacks from atop his Command Tower. He will summon Split Damage AoEs on each alliance, do Conal AoEs from the Command Tower itself, summon fissures under players like the ones from earlier, and also place AoEs on several players you should try to spread out. It's a lot of AoEs and dodging, but the command tower stays still, so focus on dodging first and foremost, and then getting your damage on the tower. Once it's destroyed, Hashmal will use Land Waster to deal high damage to the raid. In his second phase, Hashmal mostly repeats his attacks from phase 1, though with much more ferociousness. He now summons two control towers that he'll cut up, so make sure you're not in the fall path of either of them. He'll also summon far more Earth Hammers, so getting far away from the origin point is way more important here, because it's a lot of damage. He still uses Extreme Edge and Rock Cutter, though Extreme Edge is usually accompanied by Fissures or the AoE marks to spread out at the same time. After using several of the attacks you will recognize, Hashmal will use Summon, bringing forth two Pennant Stone Golems. These Golems use Demolish for raid-wide damage over and over again, with each Demolish powering the Golem up a little more and making them grow. You'll want to focus them down ASAP so their demolishes don't get strong enough for them to wipe the raid, while dodging Hoshmal's other attacks. After the golems are dead, Hoshmal will introduce his final tower, the Submission Tower. He will summon three of these along the outside of the arena. When they fall over, they crush any in their path and leave behind a path of blue fire, which you will want to avoid stepping in. This basically separates the arena into three sections, each with its own Sand Sphere add. You actually already set up the markers for this as well when you set up the markers for the Sand Spheres earlier, so go to your Alliance's Sand Sphere and kill it to end the Submission Tower phase. After that, Hoshmal keeps repeating his final phase until he is dead. Between Hoshmal and the third boss are a few more Seek adds, as well as an Archeo Demon and two Archeo Lions. Each Alliance tank can pick up one mob, and we focused on killing the Lions first, and then the Demon. The Lions use Dragon's Voice and Ram's Voice, like most Chimera mobs do, which can be both silenced and stunned, so try to do one or the other if you see these voice skills. For the Demon, just avoid its Karma and Unholy Darkness AoEs. At this point, there will be a long run, and swim for some people, for the three alliances to the third boss, so take in the sights until you get there. The third boss is Rothakael, and he is definitely the easiest of the four bosses. Place markers and a triangle formation around the arena to designate locations for a mechanic later. Rothakael himself uses mostly straightforward attacks. His Crush Helm debuff will be placed on the tank, gradually increasing their damage taken up to four stacks. You'll want to as soon as these stacks once they hit 4, otherwise you may end up only removing one or two of the stacks and then needing to as soon as the other stacks. He also uses Crush Weapon, which consecutively aims AoEs at the raid, dealing damage and giving Voln stacks if you get hit. When Rafakael charges at someone with the Chariot attack, he will deal damage at said target and anyone in his path. The damage is flat and not proximity based, so running towards Rafakael can ensure he doesn't really move at all during this attack. Once he reaches the target location, he will do a 180 degree AoE, which you should try to get behind him in order to avoid. It just gives you a Voln stack and does damage if it hits, but try not to let it. 
After a few mechanics, Raphael will summon several clones and jump into the air before casting Maverick. When Maverick finishes casting, the adds will charge across the room, so be sure to be out of all the AoE markers. His next attack is Trample, which will have Raphael dash around in a figure 8, damaging any player he makes contact with, and making them deal reduced damage. Just get out of his way when you see that figure 8 on the ground or when he just starts casting Trample. As he gets lower in HP, Raphael will summon three Archaeodemons, which use the same abilities they did before. You'll want each alliance to quickly get within the barrier around each demon and kill it quickly. Raphael himself will ride along the outer edge of the arena, so try to avoid hanging along the outer edge of your barrier as he approaches. It will stun and deal high damage to you if Raphael actually hits you. Once the demons are dead, Raphael will return to the arena and do high damage to everyone. The last phase is mostly the same as phase 1, except Raphael will now summon traps called embraces around the arena. Stepping on one places a cleansable bind on anyone nearby, which can make dodging mechanics harder. Do your best to avoid them while avoiding the rest of his attacks. As a healer, I sometimes will trigger them on purpose and just cleanse the, uh, the bind away, just to make sure nobody else steps on them. Eventually, Raphael will start using Dark Gaius, causing him to disappear and summon a bunch of dark circles. You can interact with these circles to get rid of them, which you'll need to do or Raphael is going to show you a bad time. While in the Dark Gaius, you'll still be subject to the bind from any of the embrace traps that are lingering around. So, like I said, you may want to get rid of some of those prior to entering this attack. Upon exiting, also be ready to dodge a set of Maverick charges. Other than that, the only new mechanic you'll see in this phase is a proximity AoE from Raphael's location. The only way that's going to be trouble is if you accidentally step on an Embrace Trap and get stuck in melee range of the boss. So just keep that in mind and finish him off to move on to the final boss. The final boss of the raid is Argath the Dolphus. He has quite a few unique tricks up his sleeve, but is overall easier than Hoshmal from earlier. Argoth uses Crippling Blow as a tank buster, as well as Crush Weapon from the previous fight. He also uses Soul Fix, which is a point-blank AoE you should avoid, as it gives you a stacking, unnerved debuff. This debuff not only causes you to take increased damage, but at 3 stacks you turn into a chicken and run away from the boss. Fire 4 is a room-wide AoE damage and isn't too threatening, and he also later in the fight does a bunch of narrow cone AoEs in a slashing formation. The primary mechanic of this encounter is the Truth or Lies of the Gods. Occasionally, Argoth flashes a giant mask on the screen before issuing a command to every player. If you are shown this mask you see right now, then you must follow whatever Argoth's commands tell you to do. If you see the other mask on your screen, then that means you need to do the opposite of whatever Argath is telling you to do. Luckily, Argath only issues one of two commands. The scatter command means you need to run around constantly until the command is gone, or if he's lying, you need to stand perfectly still. If you get the turn command, you need to look away from Argoth, if he's lying to you though, then you need to keep looking at him until the command wears off. There are lots of different ways to tell whether Argath is telling the truth or lying. The most obvious ones are the two different masks from earlier that flash on the screen. Argath is also a voice acted raid boss and will actually yell at you when he's telling the truth or lying. His text is also present on the screen, telling you which command he is issuing. He gets a buff that says which mask he's currently wearing at times, and if you have your camera zoomed out far enough, you can even see both masks over his shoulders, and whichever one he's using will start spinning around crazy. Any of these tells will work, so use whichever one is easiest for you. Failure to properly perform a command will give you stacks of unnerved, so do your best to follow Argoth's commands properly. Argoth's next attack is Judgment Blade. Argath will summon multiple square AoEs that apply an uncleansable bleed to anyone who steps inside of them. He also marks two players with a sword marker over their heads. When he jumps away, the markers will disappear and do a cross-shaped AoE. We want to place these in any of the four corners of the arena. Also, Argath will come crashing down with a proximity AoE, so get far away from the impact point. Next, Argath will use Royal Blood, summoning several shades that tether to random players. These shades take reduced damage when they're near each other, so if you're tethered, run away from the other shades and players and have the Alliance kill them off. You only need to run them away from the other shades. Once you're away from them, you can stop and actually DPS the shade yourself. Argath has a transition phase after a couple of minutes, summoning a bunch of shards of emptiness that channel energy into him. Kill them off and Argath will cast Dark Ultima, likely more powerful the longer it takes to kill the shards. After Dark Ultima, the entire outer edge of the arena will be covered in a blue fire. Touching this blue fire turns you into a zombie, which will attack allies for a few seconds before you drop dead on the ground. You'll want to avoid getting 3 stacks of the debuff from Argath's commands and the soul fix AoE, as well as any other mechanics that might risk you touching the walls. 
Gnawing Dread is an attack Argath uses frequently in the final phase. While under this ability's effect, you'll have a finger pointer spinning over your head. Anytime you try to move your character, the finger will freeze in whatever position it was facing, and you'll be forced to run in that direction. You'll have to navigate this debuff in order to dodge AoEs from the bosses, including a new one called Cold Blood later on, so things like stutter stepping to get it in the right position or solid reaction times help a lot. Remember, if you don't like the position you're running, stop moving and let the cursor spin more so you can try to line it up with where you want to go. Argath also uses Trepidation, which summons several orbs that gradually fall into a marked AoE circle. We simply had someone ensure to be standing under each of them before they hit the ground, which did light damage to each person hit. Probably raid-wide damage or some sort of debuff if you don't actually do that. After you've seen Trepidation, you've pretty much seen every mechanic. The Cold Blood one I mentioned earlier is an AoE you'll have to use the Gnawing Dread debuff to run into, so you're going to have to get good at that cursor, mostly for that mechanic later on. Other than Cold Blood, though, it's just going to be a repeat of things you've already seen before at this point. So, congratulations, you finished the Royal City of Rabinaster. Thank you for watching my guide to the 24-man raid for patch 4.1. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned for all the latest information, news, guides, well, everything you're looking for. I'll see all of you in the next one, and until then, take care.